It's always such a joy and an honor to be here at Linksfield Shul. I think this is the first public lecture we're having in our shul in a long time. So I want to thank the chief and his Robertson for showing up tonight. And we really appreciate it and we look forward. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Avtson, for your warmth and your friendship. This beautiful campus is a symbol of belief and faith in the future. Because, you know, so often I hear in the community people saying, well, we have to downsize this and scale back that, and, uh, you know, what's for the future? But, but you know what, really, the, the future is not about predicting, because we're all in Hashem's hands. Rather ask, what kind of future do we want to have, and how do we get there? That's about creating a future, and that's why when you look around at this incredible campus that was so generously donated by Ivan and Annette Zaltzman, it is a declaration of optimism in the future of our community. It is saying that we will create the kind of community that we want, and we're going to make this a shul the center of Jewish life. And today, the shul is growing, and it has a bigger membership than it's had in decades. So I want to pay tribute to you, Rabbi Avtson, and to your Rebbitson, and to the uh, Linksfield Shul Committee, Chairman Wayne Marks, thank you for the inspiration that you give to me personally. A few Pesachs ago, it was actually more than a few, was the, about two, three weeks before Pesach, and that's why I'm reminded of it now because we're just, you know, just under two weeks away from Pesach. I was actually on the lawns of the, of the union buildings, and I was there as part of a protest march against then President Jacob Zuma. And why are we all here? Because we want our freedom. Yeah, it was freedom. the height of state capture in South Africa. And I'll, I'll never forget it. it was, uh, there was a crowd of about, I don't know, 20, 30,000 people on the lawns. There'd been this incredible protest march through the streets of Pretoria. And uh, when I got up to speak, it was a few religious leaders were given an opportunity to speak. And when I got up to speak, I said to the crowd, We celebrate the festival of Passover. And Moses went to Pharaoh. And I sh shouted out to the crowd, What did he say to Pharaoh? And the whole crowd spontaneously said, He said, And then I said, Okay, we're here on the, on the lawns of the union buildings. Uh, Jacob Zuma is behind us in his office. What are we going to tell him? And the, the, the crowd began chanting, let my people go, let my people go. Let my people go, let my people go. What, what moved me about that is, you know, the sense of, you know, Pesach, we, we know Pesach, it's part of what it means to be a Jew, it goes, uh, you know, to, to our upbringing, it's part of who we are. But, but the, the events of Pesach, the events of Pesach, of, of the exodus from Egypt, have captured the imagination of all of humanity because it represents the calling for freedom. And that call for freedom is something which is so deep in human nature. And that's why the crowd responded. Because we, we live in a country where so many people know the Torah. They know the, the Hebrew Bible. And so for them, the, the, the story of the book of Exodus is, is part of what they grew up with as well. And there was a sense of kindred spirit, of shared values. And that celebration of freedom. It also, and I didn't take it for granted, that we live in a free country. We live in a country where you can stand on the lawns in front of the president's office and you can lead a demonstration and say to the president, let my people go and your corruption is beyond the pale and stop thieving the country. And you can do that without fear. You can do that without fear. And at the time, if you recall, I changed the prayers that uh, we prayed for the, for the president. And I said, you know, may, may God bless us with a president who's morally worthy of this nation. And it, there, there was a lot of discomfort in the community. Many people felt it was going too far. But I, firstly, I believe that the Torah has to be a moral voice. We, Torah values has to stand up for morality and justice. And, but, but more than that, when you're living in a free country, then you can do that. And we need to celebrate that freedom and realize that that is one of the greatest gifts that we have. And I, I mention that now because we are living in a world where we can see that you cannot take human freedom for granted. The, the, the war that is taking place in Europe, the aggression of Russia against the Ukraine, 
is about a totalitarian state where there is no freedom, where people, where people live in fear of their lives, and because there's no sense of freedom, and then a dictatorship launches an unprovoked war against a neighbor. And what that is really about is the struggle for freedom. And human um, civilization and human history has shown that struggle, uh, has, has shown that struggle throughout our, our um, throughout the journey of humanity has been the struggle for freedom. And it is so powerful that the Torah, the story of the Jewish people begins with the story of freedom. And there's an amazing Mishnah in Pirkavot, the, the Mishnah in chapter six, the, uh, the, the Mishnah says that, the, uh, refers to a verse in the Torah that says, the tablets came down, when Moses brought the tablets down with the 10 commandments, it says, the, the writing on the tablets was the writing of God, Charut al haluchot engraved on the tablets, and the Mishnah says, Al tikra charut el cheirut. Don't read engraved charut, but cheirut, which means freedom. Shein lecha ben chorim el amisho Torah. There is no one who is truly free except one who is involved in Torah. Meaning, freedom is engraved on the tablets representing the Torah. Freedom goes to the heart of the message of the Torah. And that is why this festival of Pesach is so significant. It is defined by our sages as Zman Cherutenu, the time of our freedom. Not even called the time of our redemption or, or, or the time of our gratitude, which of course it all is. It is Zman Cherutenu, the time of our freedom, means Jewish history begins with a struggle for freedom and the gift of God to his people, the gift of freedom. And we remember that gift each and every single day. As we know, there's a mitzvah to remember the going out of Egypt every day. And what I wanted to explore with you this evening is this Torah vision for freedom. What does it look like? What do we mean when we say, how can the Mishnah say, Torah has the ultimate blueprint for freedom? In what way? And I think number one, on the most basic level, is political and economic freedom. We live in a, in a gifted, blessed time that we actually live in a free country where you can practice what it means to be a Jew without any fear of discrimination. And so political freedom, and that's not just for, for Jews, for every human being, political freedom is the entrance to it. And the Torah is very careful in its protection against the abuse of political power. We don't have time to go into it tonight, but there's an elaborate system of constitutional and other laws which have been put in place by Hashem in the Torah to protect political freedom so that the rights of citizens are not trampled upon by government. Laws, mitzvahs which create the concept of accountability, transparency, laws which uh, prevent the abuse of, uh, of civil rights. There's, there, there is an entire framework of these laws which I actually wrote about extensively at the time that I wrote my PhD. So there's a sense of political freedom, but also economic freedom. The concept of economic freedom, where the, uh, the, the, which is twofold from a, from a Torah perspective. Number one is the fact that the Gomorrah makes it very clear that there has to be freedom to trade. That the concept of a free market is the most basic human right, the way a person earns their parnosa. You can't stop a person from trying to earn their living, to set up a business, to compete. The Gomorrah is... is fully in favor of that, not only in the cause of freedom, but for in the interests of consumer benefit. But at the same time, economic freedom is not only what we can take for ourselves. At the same time, economic freedom is what we can give to others. And the mitzvah of tzedakah, which we know is a foundation principle of Torah, and that is at, uh, giving between 10 and 20 percent. It's a very high bar. Many people would think there's a, a, they're generous in their charity, but when the, when the halacha defines as between 10 and 20 percent, that is the minimum definition. 10 percent of disposable income is the minimum definition of generosity. So when we're talking about economic freedom, it's not just about freedom of the market, it is about compassion and, and generosity and helping those who are less fortunate. But political and economic freedom are centered around one concept, and that is the uniquely Torah perspective, which is that every human being is created, but Selim Elohim in the image of God, as the Mishnah Pirkavos says, Chavi Adam Shenivra Betselem, beloved is the human being created in God's image, and that means for the human spirit, for, for, the, for the spirit of God 
for the soul to flourish, it needs a safe space to do it. It needs freedom. It needs political freedom, economic freedom from, um, from desperate need in order to flourish in its fullness. And that, that is part of the message of what Pesach is about, why it says in the Torah, be kind to the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt, where the Netziv of Elohim says that means realize the human potential that lies beneath the surface, that we were the strangers in Egypt and it was about us whom they said in Egypt nothing would become of us and that we were a threat to society and that we needed to be subjugated and yet look we flourished and turned into such a, an amazing people with such a remarkable contribution. Therefore, Never underestimate the greatness of the human spirit and see beyond any externalities of race or gender or any differentiators between human beings because Khabib Adam Shaniva Basilim, beloved is the human being created in God's image, and we need a political and economic environment that can allow the Tselem Elohim, the image of God, to truly flourish. But if we were to only leave our discussion about freedom and our reflections about Pesach, around political and economic freedom, we would only be, be at the start of that journey. It would be insufficient because actually freedom is deeply personal. Hear, hear what, this, what this Mishnah is saying. A person is only truly free when they live with the Torah. And what does that mean? That is way beyond macro politics and economic policy. That is something which is deeply personal. And when, think about when we say in the Machsor that Pesach is man cheruteinu, the time of our freedom. Hear the wording. That's not a moment in history. On Pesach, we are not just remembering what happened more than 3,300 years ago, that there was a moment that we all became free. It is man cheruteinu. It is a time when we reflect and we embrace freedom. Compare that to what we say on Sukkot. What do we say on Sukkot? Zman sim chaseinu, the time of our joy. So it, 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 meaning it's not remembering a particular event. It is about a theme, it's about a spirit, it's about a value. In the same way Sukkot is about the time when we truly imbibe the concept of happiness and contentedness and a sense of joy of life, Pesach is the time that we imbibe the sense of freedom and what it means to be truly free. And freedom is not only in the courts and in parliament and civil rights. Freedom is in our very sense of identity and it goes to the heart of who we are. Because what God gave us, and this is a remarkable thing if we stop to think about it for a moment. God gave every human being, Bechira Chofshis, free choice. At the heart of what it means to be a human being, and the Rambam says this in Hilchos Tshuva, that the defining quality of a human being, which no other creature in all of God's universe has, that is the idea of free choice, that we can truly be free and we can choose the path that we want. God gives us the mitzvahs, he tells us what we should do, but ultimately that decision remains our own. And we need to have a sense of what does it mean to truly be free and understand that the decisions that we make are our own decisions and to understand at the same time that therefore we embrace our freedom, but we also embrace responsibility and the sense of accountability that comes from it. And notice the language of the Mishnah when it says, Ein lecha ben chorin. A son of freedom. You know that term we say a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah. Son of a mitzvah, daughter of a mitzvah. Why, why that terminology? When you're a son of a mitzvah or a daughter of a mitzvah, what that means is mitzvah defines who you are. So at the moment that a child becomes an adult, then we say they're defined by mitzvah. Bar mitzvah means is the Aramaic bar is the son, is, is ben, ben mitzvah. So when it says ben chorim, it means our defining essence is freedom. So we have to understand what that means and truly feel that sense of freedom. But it, 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 goes, it goes beyond that because when, when, we, when we're understanding what freedom means to us on a, on a personal level, it also means this. And, and here it touches on this idea of how can the Mishnah say, the only person who's truly free is someone who's involved in Torah. How can that be? You know, and, and you can say many wonderful things about the Torah and the mitzvahs, but it doesn't sound like freedom should be the defining quality of it. I mean, here we're talking about a system with uh, 613 commandments and an entire Shulchan Aruch, which governs 
every moment that we are awake. From the moment we open our eyes, we have the halacha, you have to say modeani, to the moment we close our eyes at night, we have got one halacha, one rule, after another, after another. It, it seems to, you can say, well, it's a system that has inspiration, it has this, it has that, but freedom, how, how's that, how does that make us free? How can one say the only person who's free, and not only is the Mishnah saying it makes you free, it's saying the only person who's truly free is if we, we embrace our sense um, of the Torah. So um, what, what the, the Tiferes Israel says in his commentary on this Mishnah is that what the Torah does is it connects us with our neshama, with our soul. And, and what that means is when it says that it's the way to freedom, it liberates us to be who we truly are. And that sense of liberation is when, when we connect with our deepest, innermost purpose and meaning in life. Because it can be very confusing to be a human being. We're made up of two parts. We're made up of body and soul. And w what is the, the blueprint for how best to live and to integrate body and soul and to achieve our purpose that is, what, that is what Hashem gave us. It says he looked into the Torah and he created the world and he created us. And so therefore, when we are living with the mitzvahs, when we are uh, giving charity and when we're speaking kindly and when we're acting with compassion and when we are keeping Shabbos and when we are learning Torah and when we're davening and when we're contributing to community and when we are reaching beyond ourselves to be selfless and contributing and make a difference and sensitive and have empathy. When we living with all of the mitzvahs, it's not that we've got an external burden that has been imposed upon us. It is that we are living who we truly are. We are actually connecting with the truest essence. And that is, there is nothing more liberating and freeing and, um, and uplifting than that sense. And it doesn't mean that it's easy to do or that there's a, that, that, that it's a life of leisure, it's not. But it actually helps us to feel better about ourselves. It has a sense of the spiritual health. You know, I often think of it in, in the context of, of exercise. Running and, and going and doing exercise or, or healthy eating looks like it's a life of restriction because you've got you know, so, much to, so many runs, running to do so many kilometers, th th this kind of food you can eat, can't eat. So it looks like it's a life of restriction, but actually it's liberating. If the person can connect to that, then they can feel that they're feeling healthy. They're feeling physically healthy. And when we're doing mitzvahs, we are feeling at that moment spiritually healthy. We are feeling liberated. It's actually, it helps us to live with inspiration and meaning and purpose. And it's what the Mabit says, a fascinating point on this, because this verse where it says that the letters were engraved on the tablets, which it says freedom was engraved on the tablets, was said moments before the tablets were smashed when Moses saw the, the, the people worshipping at the golden calf. And, and you know what he points out? According to the Midrash, you know what happened? He was carrying the tablets and they were so heavy. And when, when he saw the golden calf and the sin that the people were doing by worshipping the golden calf at the foot of Mount Sinai, it says that the letters on the tablets miraculously flew off the tablets and went up to the heavens in a sense of protest at what they were seeing. And, and then the tablets became too heavy to carry and he dropped them. He didn't smash them according to this minrash. He dropped them because they were too heavy to carry. The letters on the tablets made it lighter to carry. The mitzvahs. The Torah that we live makes our lives lighter and easier to carry, not heavier. There's lots to do, but that doing liberates our true essence, and that's why the Mishnah says, Ein lecha ben chorim ele misha But there's, there, there's one other point here. Note the language, and the Pirkei Moshe says this in his commentary. Note the language here. Ein lecha ben chorim. There is no free person, Ella, except for one who, who, who keeps Torah. Now, what does it mean there is no free person? Because think about this. Freedom itself is an illusion. We like to think that we're free as human beings. we free because we only define freedom in terms of political rights. So we think we've got the right to vote, we've got, we've got the right of movement, the right of association, we're free. But actually, how much human freedom do we have? We, we uh, as human beings, we are constrained by the bodies in which we live. We are constrained by uh, financial need, by health needs. 
There's a struggle to survive. There is so much which is beyond our control. We have a mitzvah to try our best, but ultimately the success and, 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 and what we want to achieve in our lives, there are so many factors which are beyond our control, which are completely in the hands of Hashem, including our health and our wealth and so much and children and family and so much which is beyond our control. And then in the end, death itself. And, and, and that's what the Mishnah Pirke Avot says, Kula Yeludim Lamutu, whoever is born dies. There's a, a, a net which is spread across all living things. There's no way out. We think we're so free, but, then, but no one can defy death. And we think we're so free, but no one is completely in control of their lives. So what freedom is there really? Can we really say the human being is free? Except when it comes to Torah, freedom is transcendence. This word chayrut, it's a very interesting word, um, the, uh, and, and, and it's an idea which, n not on this particular point, we'll, we'll come to it in a moment, but it's uh, an idea I read in the writings of Rav Yitzchak Kosovsky, who we'll speak about in a moment, where he said that the Hebrew word which we normally find in the Chumash for freedom is chofshi, it's chofesh, it's drawer, the other words. The word chayrut is more than freedom, it is transcendence. Ein lecha ben chorim, there's only a truly transcendent person, which means this, we know through Torah that our neshama, our soul comes here on a journey and that we, we, we enter this world and against, as the Mishnah says in Pirka Avod, against your will you're born and against your will you die, we come through this world and we're here for a short amount of time and we, 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 we pray and we hope it's 120 years, but even 120 years is short in, this, in the sweep of eternity. And our soul comes here on a journey to do good in this world. And Hashem sends us down into this world to do good, to do mitzvahs, to rise to the challenges. And whatever happens to us is part of the mission of our soul. And so therefore what the Pirkei Moshe says, there's no one who is transcendent because no matter what happens, the good, the bad, the painful, the joyous, the, the, the successes, the failures, no matter what happens, if we approach it from the philosophy of the Torah where we can feel the hand of Hashem in everything that happens to us, even when we don't understand why it's happening, but we can feel His presence in our lives and we can feel that sense of connection and we realize the purpose and the mission and we realize that death is not the end, that it is a journey onto another world, to Alam Haba, to a world of eternity where we take all of our mitzvahs with and we leave we, every, all the good that we did, we take it with us on that journey and it's not lost and life on this earth is valuable because of that, then no matter what happens to us, we are transcendent. We transcend events because no matter what happens in the day to day and no matter the things where we thought we'd be successful and we weren't and the things that we thought we would fail and we didn't, all of that, it doesn't matter because it is the mitzvahs that we take from all of those experiences which transcend the events, which transcend the temporary nature of the fleeting nature of life which we take with us then into the next world. The only transcendent person is a person who understands that we are here on a divine mission and that our souls are on a journey and that we take with us all of the mitzvahs and the good that we do on that journey, that is a transcendent perspective, then nothing can harm us because no matter what pain we go through, we realize it is part of the journey of our soul and it is an opportunity, the good and the painful, the success and the failure is an opportunity to grow and to become a better person so that we can take all of those mitzvahs with us as we journey on to Olam Haba. The final point that I wanted to share with you about this, that freedom is engraved on the tablets of the Ten Commandments, that freedom is engraved on the Torah, is uh, an idea that I read of a message that Rav Yitzchak Kosovsky, who was uh, the Av the Beisdin of Johannesburg, and he, he delivered this message in Johannesburg in 1938. And that was just before all of the devastation and destruction of uh, the Holocaust took place. And he delivered a message, but at that 1938, everyone was afraid of the future, that they could see the storm cl clouds gathering in Europe. And he came with a message that said this, when we talk about Chayrut, freedom, 
It's, it means more than simple freedom. It means transcendence. But he applied it not just personally, as we've been discussing. He applied it on another level. He said it applies to the Jewish people. That he said that it applies to the Jewish people. That the Jewish people, we are transcendent. We are transcendent above the laws of history. By any of the normal laws of history, we should not be here. As a nation that was scattered amongst all of the nations, two, almost 2,000 years without, without having a land, without, without having a sense of, of sovereignty, without the stability that comes from that, with many enemies in all different directions, with threats of, of um, hatred and assimilation, no other nation has withstood what we have withstood and still been here. And so he says that cheirutz, man cheirutenu, means that we as the Jewish people are transcendent. We transcend the laws of history. And he was saying to the community in 1938, don't know what lies ahead in the future, but know this, that whatever happens, we will get through it because we have a divine history, we have a divine destiny, and no matter what happens in this world, we will, we will make it through. As a nation, we will get there. And he didn't know what, what was around the corner. And of course you could say, well, if he would have known that the Holocaust was just around the corner, if he would have known that in 1938, would he have delivered that message to the community? And I believe that he would have. Because the horror and the pain of the Holocaust, unspeakable. And, and it's, it's beyond a sense of comprehension to even begin to, to verbalize any kind of response. But, but think about putting that darkness, putting that darkness um, aside without an attempt to understand or to rationalize or to philosophize because that can, only, that can only desecrate the memory of the martyrs of the Holocaust. But think about the fact that within three years of the Holocaust, the, there was the reestablishment of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. Within the years that followed, there was a rebirth of Torah learning throughout the world, in North America, in Israel, here in South Africa, where there was a rebirth of, of, of Torah learning to the point where today there are more people in full-time Torah learning in yeshivas and kolalim in the world than there have ever been in the history of the Jewish people. And, and yet in the Holocaust, everything was destroyed. The yeshivas, the great Hasidic dynasties, the, the, it, was, it was laid waste. And from that, after that, not from that, but after that, there was this amazing, miraculous resurgence of a people that can only be explained by the divine hand of Hashem, where, where, where Israel began in, in, in a, a vulnerable way in 1948, invaded on all sides, by um, enemies who sought its complete destruction and through the decades has seen off every attempt to annihilate it and in spite of all of the enemies is a thriving state with a growing economy with a, a tremendous contribution to technology and medicine and every field of human endeavor and thriving yeshivas where, where in Israel, in America, all over a thriving and a return of Jewish life that is completely miraculous. You can feel the sense of transcendence of Jewish history. And, and that, doesn't, that doesn't take away one moment from the darkness and the pain and everything that we have been through as a nation. But what it does tell us is that we are operating on that level of cheirut, of the sense of transcendence, and that is what Pesach is about. So if you would say, what is Pesach? It's man cheirusenu, it's the time of freedom. It is our time to reflect on freedom. It is our time to think about what the, the importance of protecting political freedom and economic freedom and defending that with everything that we have and appreciating what, what that is. It is at the time to feel the sense of personal freedom that comes with free choice and what that means to our sense of accountability and responsibility for our actions. It is about freedom of liberating ourselves to become who we truly are, connecting with our deepest nature. 
it is about that sense of transcendence above the events of this world on a personal level no matter what happens we are on a divine journey we are on a divine mission and we can transcend anything that that, that happens to us because it is all part of our mission and the, and and whether that applies on a national level that we have this great privilege of being part of the Jewish people where we have this divine destiny that we, we, we saw and we felt when we, when we left Egypt and we say it in the Haggadah, Vihishi Amda, that sense of whatever happens in any generation, we somehow transcend and get there to the end. That is what Pesach is about. Zman Cherusenu, it's not just remembering an anniversary of something that took place 3,300 years ago. It is about living with freedom now. It is to make a sense of freedom part of our lives. What that means in every dimension, on a societal level, on a personal level, level and on a national level and then to realize that is our calling it goes to the heart of what it means to be a Jew and to celebrate this Pesach with a sense of gratitude to Hashem for the great gift of freedom thank you so much and wishing you all a good Yantif such a great joy to be here